We are at the Reigns and welcome to the Greater Baltimore Church. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm Kristen. I'm Katie and we're the Broom family from Eldersburg. I just wanted to welcome everyone to the Greater Baltimore Church of Christ. I'm going to share a scripture. I'm reading from Psalm 68 verse 5 and into 6. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. And for those of you that don't know, uh, we are the lonely family. <laughs> uh, my husband and I uh, got married in campus and um, we adopted our two children. Uh, our oldest son is in college and our youngest is here. And so that is our family scripture. Let's pray. God, I just wanna thank you so much for <clears throat> just allowing us to be together uh, even though we're meeting virtually, uh, just to, to still be connected, to still be together, to still, uh, you know, share in, in prayer and, and, you know, hearing, um, you know, hearing a message uh, from the Bible and, and just still being able to, you know, being able to, to, to listen to music and being able to connect. And just uh, thank you that we're, we're still able to do that um, even through this time. And I just pray that, uh, you know, we, we, we can, um, you know, be together in person very soon. Um, and that uh, you just you know continue to uh, to watch over us and and all of the needs um, uh, that are going on with us and then you know throughout uh, throughout the country as well. And just thank you so much for everything you've done for us. Pray in your son's name. Amen. Hey. Hi. Good morning and welcome to the Greater Baltimore Church online service. My name is David Chukweke. And I'm Faith Bender. We're so glad to have you here with us this morning. So Faith, what's on the agenda for today? Well, this morning, we will be engaging in a wonderful time of worship, hearing an impactful lesson, and remembering Jesus' sacrifice on the cross during a time of communion. Is there anything for the children today? Of course! We will have a super fun and engaging children's worship song to get us up on our feet. And if you're visiting with us today, you're truly our honored guest. Please go click on Get Connected on our website, thegreaterbaltimorechurch.org, in order to see the amazing things we do in Baltimore. Also, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe on our YouTube channel. And also like and share if you're with us on Facebook to engage more people with our services. So sit back and enjoy service. Bye. Bye. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to
morning church. Uh, this morning we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time in the scriptures and continue in our series of Jesus the same. Uh, this morning we're going to be talking about specifically the sincerity of Jesus and uh, I, I have to be honest personally this was a, a hard topic for me to speak on. Uh, primarily it was it was difficult because I spent a good bit of my time uh, at work uh, with people who are not entirely sincere when, when I deal with them. I've got employees who um, don't always tell me um, the truth with sincerity. I've got clients that are oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, struggle with, with whether or not they're telling me the truth or, or simply trying to get a better deal on a consulting engagement. Uh, but, but today we're going to explore the sincerity of Jesus. And this is the second chapter uh, that we're talking about. And um, we've dedicated this fall to, to learn more about Jesus, to draw closer to Jesus. And uh, not simply intellectual knowledge about Jesus or facts about Jesus. We're looking to make a heart connection with him by learning about him, appreciating some of his more finer qualities, and then drawing closer to him at a heart level. When you think about Jesus' sincerity. You have to understand first what sincerity itself means. And, and there are many great virtues and character traits uh, that, that we're going to learn about, whether it's courage or generosity or, or loyalty. And, and some of them are, are great attributes to have. 
But without the foundational part of integrity, honesty, sincerity, you can't build a relationship. Uh, you can't have a healthy marriage without sincerity. And you definitely cannot have a healthy relationship with God if it's not based on sincerity. Our hearts crave for sincerity. Instinctively, we know this because when someone is insincere with us, when someone seeks to deceive us, when someone is uh, insincere, we feel it. We're repulsed by it. We have a visceral reaction. We see it oftentimes in our politicians or if the last time you went to buy a used car, um, you, you understand when people have ulterior motives for what they say and they do. Now, if you happen to be either a politician in listening or a used car salesman, I am sure that they are sincere uh, members of both communities, but I haven't met one yet. But so it, I'll give it to you another way. Think of it as parents. We want our children uh, to be sincere. We want them to be honest. We want them to be true with us, honest and true. Uh, but children are so honest. Um, they're free from pretense. Um, if you ever want to know um, how your new haircut looks, ask a child, right? They will tell you the unadulterated truth. Um, I want you to look at this video um, and, and think about the sincerity and the honesty in these two young men. Um, they, it, they're adorable, and uh, I, I want you to, to just see exactly what I mean. A great example of true sincerity. Please welcome three-year-old James. Mr. Mayor, how are you? Good. You want to grab a seat? Sure. <laughs> You're the mayor at three years old? <laughs> yes. What are your duties as the mayor? Um, I shake everybody's hands. Your pants are black and my pants are black. That's, look man, I wore my black pants because they said that the mayor was going to wear black pants, so I said I better wear my black pants. And look, we both got on black shoes. Yeah. And black laces. Black laces. Yeah. Let me ask you something, James. What's the best thing that's happened to you since you've been mayor? Um, my brother was a mayor twice. <laughs> How old is your brother? 30? No. 26? No. How old are you, Robert? Can, can he come up? Come here. How are you, sir? Good. Good. Come on over here. got black shoes on like me and you, he got, he got black shoes on like me and you. Yeah. This is black shoe day. Yep. You, you've been the mayor? Twice. I already said that. <laughs> Yeah, James, James told us you had been the mayor twice. Do you give your brother any tips on how to be mayor? Yeah. Like what? When you shake people's hands, you shake them with the right, and when you talk to them, you look in them in the eyes. Wow. That's pretty good, man. So, Mr. Harvey? Yes, sir? Um... I need to tell you something really quick because I like people. Uh, 
You what? I like people. You like people? That's good. You know what I think, James? I think a lot of people like you too. Uh. How do you get to be mayor? Somebody shakes up this bucket or a hat, and then they pull out this car, Are you kidding and me? then they put the on it, and whoever's name is on it, they get to be mayor. Huh? Everybody, don't interrupt me when I'm talking to Steve. <laughs> Mr. Harvey? Yes, sir. Um. You're the bestest man in the world. Hey, James, I love you. You do? You're very respectful. You call me Mr. Harvey. You're only three. I love you, man. Wasn't that an adorable video? Um, you, you know sincerity when you see it. Um, the, the video warms our hearts because those two little boys were so genuine. They were so sincere. And I, for one, I, I love Steve Harvey. I think he's hysterical. But it, when you see that video, it's no wonder that Jesus himself said in Matthew 19, verse 14, do not hinder the children, let them come to me. And in Matthew 18, verse 3, he said to the, those who were listening to him, that you must change and become like little children to enter the kingdom. It's because of their honesty, because of their sincerity, because of the purity of their hearts that Jesus valued children. But when we grow up, we learn to have agendas or to have ulterior motives. And yet, when we see a video like that or we hear the words of Jesus, we wonder why we value sincerity. Why did that conversation warm our hearts? I bet you, many of you smiled and many of you laughed when you heard those young men. But, but why is it that something like that warms our hearts? Because sincerity is free from pretense. It's free from deceit. In other words, you say what you mean and you mean what you say. If you do things with sincerity, people instantly trust you. People instantly gravitate towards you. When you encounter a sincere person, you know that what you see is what you get, and there's comfort, there's security in that. I'll put it another way. When we call someone a friend, we use a lot of different words to describe them. You'll say, they're my best friend. Or you'll say, those are my high school friends that I grew up with. Or those are friends from the neighborhood. But one word that we never describe a friend with is insincere. We would never say to someone, oh, this is so-and-so. He is my insincere friend. Even saying those words don't sound right. And it's because those words are like oil and water. They don't go together. A friend and insincerity do not mix. But we crave sincerity. Our hearts desire for sincerity. Why? Because God has written his truth on our hearts. He's written it on our consciences. That's what Romans 2 verse 15 says. As followers of Jesus, the Bible teaches in 3 John 1 3 that we should walk in truth. That's why sincerity is so valuable to us. That we should love the truth and believe in the truth as it says in 2 Thessalonians 2 10 through 12 and we are to speak the truth in love to one another Ephesians 4 32 sincerity and truth are more than simply just a, a moral guide or some nice traits to possess you see truth has eternal ramifications read with me in John chapter 14 Verse 1 and 6. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am coming there to make a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me 
so that you also may be where I am. You know the place to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, truth has eternal ramifications. Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say that he was going to show us the truth. He didn't say he was going to teach the truth or, or model the truth. He is the truth. He is truth personified. He is the source of all truth, the embodiment of all truth, and therefore the single reference point for evaluating all other truth claims. See, he had no pretense. He had no ulterior motive. He lived out his beliefs and convictions and did not pretend to be something that he was not. Jesus was sincere in everything he did. And it was that sincerity that drove him to share his heart about his relationship with his Father and to, be, and to speak plainly about these things. Because he was that sincere man of truth, he could not hold back. He could not hold back the fact that he was the way, the truth, and the life. That he was the good shepherd to go get the sheep. That he was the gate that the sheep must pass through. That he was the bread of life. That he was the light of the world. That he was a man of truth. He could not hold back the fact that the road was narrow and the gate was small and that only a few will find it. Because he was that man of truth, he distinguished between the sheep and the goats. And he plainly told us how we could determine where we stood. You see, when you're in the presence of a man or a woman who loves like Jesus and is sincere, you feel secure because you learn and you know about God. All too often, unfortunately, people's response to sincerity of Jesus is like what we read about in John chapter 18. Turn over to John chapter 18. In John 18, once Jesus was arrested and bound, he was brought to Annas to, to face false charges and then to the high priest Caiaphas. Uh, eventually he was brought before Pilate, the, uh, the Roman governor, and, and Pilate begins to question Jesus, um, trying to figure out a way to release him, for he knew that he was innocent. And they discuss what the Jewish religious leaders claim Jesus to be and, and the reason for his arrest. We pick up the story midway, but what you see in, in Pilate's reaction is the most common reaction when faced with a person with absolute sincerity who speaks the truth. In verse 37, Pilate says, You are a king then. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate's response was, what is truth? You know, it's interesting to me that Pilate's response is all too common today. When faced with absolute truth and people who speak with sincerity we make up wild questions to sidestep our uncomfortable feeling when we face the truth you see facing the truth is the need of the hour today we have to face the truth about where our life choices have brought us we have to face the truth that we've neglected relationships that challenge us because they make us feel uncomfortable, so we avoid people who challenge us. We have to face the truth that our priorities may have changed over the last 16 to 18 months, and that we may need to rededicate ourselves to Jesus being the Lord of our lives and our time and our comfort. You see, the outcome of Pilate's question, we know what that outcome is and how it, it led to, though Pilate was so close, he was so close to the truth. 
it led him to turn Jesus over to be crucified. Let us not allow ourselves to be so close to the truth, but because of our inaction or because of our drifting, lead us to ask, really, what is truth? Can we really define truth and lose the chance to have that truth live inside of us? You see, sincerity in its purest form comes from Jesus. When Jesus speaks, there's no hint of selfish ambition or selfishness. He was never concerned with himself or his own welfare. You see, insincerity is born from seeking praise from other people. When Jesus speaks, there's nothing but genuine love and genuine concern for those who are listening. However, when Jesus spoke, he did save his strongest and harshest challenges for the religious leaders who were hypocrites. Nothing angered Jesus more than hypocrisy. You see, Jesus understood that hypocrisy is what shipwrecks people's faith. Hypocrisy causes people to question and doubt the goodness of God. When they see hypocrisy in those who claim to represent him and they yet live a double life, that is the epitome of insincerity. You may have heard it before, but the origin of the word hypocrite was taken from ancient theater times. It was, it was used to when an actor would be on stage playing a role. And we, and we think about that now and, and we find that to be interesting for me personally because, you know, I would never, ever look at an actor and say, you deceived me. You see, Harrison Ford, I believed you were really Han Solo. And then I saw you play Indiana Jones, and then I saw you play the President of the United States, and I can't believe a word you say. I can't trust you. I can't... We would never say such a thing. Because watching an actor play a role doesn't damage our faith, doesn't offend us, because we understand that Harrison Ford is paid to play a role. And therefore, he is acting a certain way, and we get to enjoy it. But when it comes to those of us who claim to walk the way Jesus walked, we call ourselves Christians, attempting to live a Christ-like life in our daily lives. God desires us to be exactly what we claim. Not to put on a show, not to act like something we're not, if we say things we don't mean or simply parrot words or phrases that we've heard others say, but we don't believe them, nor we live them, we become just like that actor who simply plays a part. I'll go one step further. When we give pat answers to difficult situations and we tell people in difficult times, just trust God. Or, just pray about it. Or, my thoughts and prayers are with you. But we don't pray. We don't believe in trusting in God ourselves. We are simply play acting. And you're fooling everyone around you, but you're not fooling God. Some of us know that we need help in our marriages. Some of us know that our Bible study and our devotional time with God has become stale. Some of us know that we're giving in to sin and we're not talking about it. We're not sharing with it. We're not confessing. We're not praying with others about it. And we know that we don't have that connection with God. You see, by nature, I'm an introvert. I, you know, I, I am tempted to retreat into myself and that is something that I work on. That is something that I, I have to surrender to God and continually learn from people like my wife, who is an extrovert, and how she treats people special, how she finds time to get with people. And I have to learn to challenge myself to be like that because I see the qualities in Arlene I see in Jesus. And those are the things that I want to imitate. 
But I don't do it to play a role. I do it to transform myself from the inside out. See, the reason why sincerity is so important is because when you deal with truth and you face the truth, you can draw power from that truth. You see, centuries have passed since Jesus died, and a lot of things have been said about him. People have called him a fanatic. People have tried to uh, call him a, a, a visionary, or they have said he was a leader of a Jewish sect, or simply a dreamer. But the fact is, no one has ever dared to call Jesus a liar. Jesus' unquestionable loyalty to the truth gives his words value and weight that no other words possess. When we listen to the words of other men, many times we have to make concessions for their lives because we know that they're not perfect. I know, as I stand here sharing these things with you, I am not perfect. My life is far from perfect. But I am humbly trying to imitate what I see in Jesus. The one thing I do is stand for the truth. Since I was, since my children were young and I was a young parent, I would ask them as often as I could these simple questions. Do you see dad act differently at church than he does at home? That simple question I asked because I knew that hypocrisy would kill a child's faith. A hypo hypocrisy at home would kill a child's faith more than anything else. That if my children thought that I was one way at church, another way at home, another way at work, then they would believe that I was acting a role in being hypocritical. And then I would wait for the answer when I asked. I knew that hypocrisy was like poison to a child. I can honestly say there were times where the kids pointed out things like my temper or when they addressed the things, the words that I use or the, my speech or my tone needed to change or the things that I, how I would treat Arlene in certain ways that they, 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 they would point these things out and, and boy, they were difficult to hear, but, but I was so grateful because I wanted them to know that their dad wanted to put God first and change to be more like Jesus. You know, 1 John 1.8 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And though I'm not a perfect man, that's not the case with Jesus. When we hear his words and we see his words, there's a certainty in his words that demonstrates his heart and his relationship with God. And that is where we can get strength and power from. In our time of, of need, whether it's in a storm of life or whether you're dealing with stress, that is our refuge. Because the deceptions of the world, they can't meet our needs. But Jesus' words can be the anchors for our soul. We can draw power from the sheer fact that G no man spoke more true words than Jesus. Today I want you to decide that sincerity is going to be a hallmark of your life. Decide today to be sincere with God. Decide today to be honest and sincere with ourselves. And decide to be sincere with each other. Pick one or two or three people that you're going to be just brutally honest and sincere with. Stop playing a role that you think is needed in church and simply be honest. Well, you must ask yourself, well, how do we maintain this life of sincerity? I got four suggestions for you. One, like I just said, reflect. We need to reflect on the cross. We need to reflect on the grace. Romans chapter 12, 1 talks about it very well. We need to reflect despite our many sins on the fact that God has forgiven us and gratitude will propel us. Secondly, depend on God and His Spirit. That alone will transform you. Meditate 
on scriptures like 1 Corinthians 13, 4, where it talks about love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. These remind us of what true biblical love is. And then take action. It's great to reflect, it's great to depend, it's great to meditate, but then take action. Keep doing good to others. Every opportunity you have, Allow yourself to be open and sincere with those around you. You know, Jesus' sincerity is something that is transformative if we allow it to change us to become men and women who are sincere. His example and his sacrifice is something that as we prepare our hearts for the communion that we should remember. Hey family, we're the Whitleys. I'm Larry. And I'm Leanne. And we want to, uh, to sh briefly share our experience uh, uh, concerning the impact of missions contributions. Our Greater Baltimore Church uh, mission campaign ends on September 30th, and we're very close to our goal. But we see this effort in a very personal way, having been members of a mission team. Yes, in 2012, um, we were asked to join uh, planting a church in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. There were a total of 21 people that included campus, singles, married, and six children under six years old. Um, and other than Larry and I, um, none of the adults were older than 35. We were everybody's grandparents. The Grandstand Church is, is what it's called. Um, was planted by the Columbia, South Carolina Church of Christ. The ironic part is that we attended Co the Columbia Church, but we lived near Myrtle Beach. And for almost two years, each Sunday, we traveled two hours each way to be a part of God's church and the fellowship. And he blessed it tremendously. Indeed, he did bless it tremendously. As a matter of fact, um, we didn't know, but he had positioned us, God had positioned us to be able to support uh, team members who were moving to Myrtle Beach to be part of the mission team there, to plant the church there. Um, we were able to accommodate a number of disciples who were moving it to the area as they searched for places to live and work, uh, etc. So, um, so God was able to 
to use us in that way. And, and we were we were blessed that we were already positioned in the area. And we knew some things about the area that, that helped the team as mm -hmm. we uh, as yeah. we prepared, prepared to do God's work in Myrtle Beach. Yeah, yeah um, initially we we met in house churches. Um, of course, we didn't have we didn't have a, a permanent location or building, but we met we met in house churches. We met in the park, and we definitely we met on the beach. We studied with people who were baptized in the uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so uh, it was it was a great experience. It was it may have been a lot different than what we may imagine a, 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 a planting would be in mm -hmm. terms of location and you know just the, the things we were able to do. Yeah. So um, we we were we had great relationships. We built relationships over the, that two year period before the planting with the different with the disciples in the uh, Columbia Church, and um, we would have Bible talks and. And they would come, they would just come and support us. And we would invite our neighbors and um, just people to our house when we were, when we were um, having house church and our brothers and sisters from Columbia would come and from Charleston, they would come just to, you know, to show their support. And it was just um, an awesome time. And just to see God working and using us, Larry and Leanne, the Whitleys, yeah. <laughs> to, um, to, spread, to, to um, spread his word and to be a part of of um a planting and the, the god you know i just feel like that he trusted us at that as old as we were not the typical uh campus or singles or um youngsters who you think about or young young marrieds or young couple young people who go out and plant the churches so god used us and i and i'm forever grateful and it's because of the, the funding from the disciples like you guys um, who helped us to be able to, to go and plant the church, have money to find the buildings and to just to do the things that we needed to do. We even had retreats just to get away and, and regroup and, you know, plan each year how we were going to um, um, just the way we were going to go go at the, what was it, 300 million people supposedly <laughs> who lived in the area that we call the Grand Strand and within the the uh, Myrtle Beach area. So, um, and it and to this day, there the church is thriving. So again, just thank you guys for um, always being willing to support missions and um, each year. And we, we really want you to know it truly helps. The money is being used and will be used to help other churches here in the states, in India, um, Ethiopia, just wherever the and, and locally here in Baltimore to help make disciples right here in our own neighborhoods. Yeah. So, so thank you so much. Um, know that God will use us in any way uh, that glorifies him. Mm -hmm. And we are so grateful. Amen. Hey there. I hope you've been able to connect with God through the worship so far. Right now, we get to continue in our worship by the all-important act of giving. That's right. When we give our money to God's church, we get to engage in the spiritual act of generosity. What a way to show our faith in God and willingness to support his ministry. So let's talk practicals. As disciples, we should set aside a sum of money in keeping with our income for the special purpose of contribution. When every member gives, no matter how little, our contribution can help accomplish some amazing things. At the Greater Baltimore Church, every week we give to support the general operations of the church. 3% of our weekly giving automatically goes to support personal benevolence, which goes towards needs of those in and outside the church. On the fourth Sunday of every month, we specifically collect for Hope Worldwide, the charitable arm of our church. Hope Worldwide supports the needs of 1.5 million people all over the globe, so let's make sure we help them help the world. Once a year, we take up special missions collection to support our missions work locally and around the world. Look out for an announcement when we take up contribution for this essential work. Even when not meeting in person, giving has never been easier. You can log into the Church Center Planning app and select Give. Text to give at 84321, or you can even mail in a check. Head to greaterbaltimorechurch.org slash give to read up more on these options, or if you want to give. Thank you so much for your contribution. We hope this has been helpful. Now, back to the service.
wasn't that amazing service? I told you it'd be good. And if you haven't done so, please hit that like and subscribe button and share it with a friend. Share the amazingness. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, whatever you got, we got it. Hit and follow. Can't wait to see you next week. Bye. Bye. All right. Are you ready to praise the name of the Lord? Come on. Sing the oh, oh, oh.